Welcome to the Technory Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Katoon. Joining me on today's show, we have got a good one. Toby Russell is the co-founder, co-CEO of Shift.com. Shift is a company that I am very interested in. The Technory Mobile lease is up, and I'm looking for a new ride. Technory is looking for a new ride. And I can't stand used car salesmen. If you are one, I do apologize. Uh, I I don't know. I just I think it's a weird business. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. The margins are super high, and yet customers always lose. I don't I don't like those businesses. And apparently, neither does Toby, because Shift.com essentially makes it easier and less troublesome uh, to buy and sell used cars. And uh, we get into the whole thing. So you just listen to the show, and you'll figure out exactly how. It's brilliant, but that's not surprising. Uh, Toby would be having a seat at the head table. If there were one for transportation transformation, uh, it'd be Travis from from Uber and Logan from Lyft, and they're they're right there. It'd be Toby and his co-founder uh, because he was the one of the people who created Taxi Magic, which ultimately became Curb. They uh, back in the CrackBerry BlackBerry days, they were the ones that you used to try to hail a cab. That was the first sort of thought of I want this on demand, and and he created that. And so um, we're talking to a person who's got a ton of experience in this space. And I think it's a very fascinating conversation, and obviously uh, it makes sense for me. Uh, before we talk to Toby, though, we got to check in with our startup inbox, which is brought to you by Active Campaign. Go beyond email marketing with True Automation by signing up at activecampaign.com slash technori. Get your first two months for free. All right, folks, here's the question. This is a good one. We I think we did this like in seven, 2017 and 18. Pretty much any time there was a boom and bust in crypto, we were here. Uh, and again, I don't know, it's dipping, Bitcoin's dipping below 10 again. Ugh. And so the question is, and, and a lot of people have people in their office who ask them, you know, if, are you into crypto? Uh, where do you get it? How do you do it? And back in the day, you know, Binance was becoming a thing and it was very complicated. It's still kind of complicated, but for a, for a newbie, it was not a, not a good place. Just really not. Um, it's still kind of not to be totally honest. But regardless, the question essentially uh, being asked here is, where is the best place to buy crypto? And I'm going to just go ahead and say, don't. Uh, if you want to play the volatility game, then okay, go ahead. Uh, easy users can go to, to Robinhood or, or Coinbase or whatever. Um, like the markets though, percentages really matter. So if you don't like math, you're going to lose your shirt trying to do crypto buying on those two because there's there's really no like it just goes out like whenever the sale is completed it's going to a, a middle it's not it's not a transaction from one seller to buyer and so there's a ton of margin that's lost so I really don't recommend that I, I still think Binance for all its faults is still like the best place for you to have control of it but I'm just going to leave you with this line because it, it stuck with me it only has value if people think other people will buy for a higher price that, my friends, is known as the greater fool theory. And I personally, despite the fact that I invest in crypto and that I own more than I should have Bitcoin at a higher price than I should, and Ethereum and Litecoin and others, the, the main, I'm not big into the alts because I just don't, it's, I don't, it doesn't tie to anything. It makes no, makes no sense. The reality is the only reason I'm in it is because of the volatility. I'm attracted to risk. I'm attracted to making money based on demand. And I feel like I've got my fingers on the pulse of demand, sort of. If you are not that, if you think you're buying something that holds value because that's what you've done in the past, I'm going to go ahead and say, really, just don't. Just don't, okay? But if you have to, if you want to play around and give your money away to all the rich folks who are pumping and dumping, go to Robinhood. Love Robinhood. Just raise a shit ton of money. Go to Robinhood. All right. We are going to go into my conversation here with a very, very, very successful and innovative entrepreneur named Toby Russell. He is the co-founder and co-CEO of Shift.com. All right, so the timing of this could not be better. I have a partnership with, or had, I don't know if it's have or had, uh, with BMW, and they provided me with an i3, which I completely love. However, the lease, it's a lease, and the lease is up uh, in August, basically this, like now. And, you know, I don't want to get into BMW stuff with the new CEO, blah, blah, blah. But their inventory is just not existent in the electric car. And I'm having a hell of a time and like dealing with these people and trying to figure out if I don't go with them, what car do I want to go with? What do I want to buy? Do I want to lease? Like, I literally don't know what I'm doing. And I'm pretty good or historically, I should say, have been pretty good in the car car business. 
And right now I literally don't know what I'm doing. And I've talked to guys like you and I've talked to guys at carlease.com and other places and everyone's just sort of like, good luck. So the, the conversation with you on shift is, is fairly fortuitous. Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah. I'm really excited to connect up and chat, Scott. We um, totally recognize that finding the right car for you and then getting it and buying it or, you know, leasing it, you name it is a really hard problem. It's, it's like the second biggest purchase you're going to make in your life. If you consider that you actually are buying a house, many people don't buy a house and most people kind of rent from the bank. So it's like the biggest purchase you make in your life, huge financial commitment. A lot of people spend more time in their cars than they do like with their kids on any given day. So it's, it's a big deal. And they're or with right their kids in their car, which is the worst, I suppose. There's that too. Um, depending on, depending on the vehicle you got there. And um, I, I'm one of those, one of those dads that definitely uh, supports the car seat in the car. So always want to check and make sure that the car seat works. So it's, oh, a, me it's too. a tricky thing to find the right thing, you know, it, it totally is. And you know, this is gonna be an interesting conversation because before we get into exactly what shift is, I just, I, I'm so, so I'm just full disclosure. I am in a, like in a race of buying up what I think are transportation stocks. I think, you know, I, I kind of passed on, on Lyft the way that they IPO'd and just the price, but Uber and Tesla and several other uh, groups that have gotten involved in sort of where things are going in transportation, I'm all in on because I think that we're right at the tipping point of where, for all the reasons you just mentioned, there's some major changes that are going to have to take place because right now, I mean, obviously I'm like sucked into the tech world. So to me, going on Tesla.com and buying a car on the internet is not crazy, although it's complicated when you've never done it before. I think that the average Joe still has to do what I'm doing right now, which is like go into random dealers and deal with stuff. And we just, it's not built the way, like we don't buy anything else that way. And so now This is like the the last little pillar to fall where it's like, all right, so how are we going to buy cars in the future? Yeah, I mean, you step back from this thing and you think about basically you buy you can buy just about anything online. And yet the largest retail category on the planet, U.S. auto, is still essentially a non-online offering. And, and this is the crazy part, it openly discriminates against huge swaths of the population. What do I mean? The haggle pricing by definition, has individual people, say it like car salesmen, this is why the used car salesman gets such a bad uh, reputation, the used car salesman trying to judge the person on the other side across them and, and, and haggle with them. And we hear lots of our users and lots of our, in our user research as we're, as we're building our technology, particularly women, folks who are new to the country or new to buying cars, are like, wow, I basically am going to get discriminated. This kind of shaken down. Everybody says that's okay. I'm yeah. going to get shaken down. And like, and we act like that's okay. Like, like, Hey, there's no technology solution for that. I'm, I just, I'm just going to have to deal with it. And uh, a lot of, a lot of women in particular that we talk to are say, no, I got to get my car guy to do this thing. My husband, brother, uncle, cousin, friend, yep. who's going to do this thing on my behalf because I am not allowed or empowered in this society to go and be able to buy like the largest purchase I would make a car. That's insane, Scott. Like technology is leveling the playing field, and, and what we're doing at Shift is trying to say, hey, anybody should be able to go online, find the thing that they want, push a button, either buy it right there or have it come to them so that they can test it and experience it in real time without like a pushy salesperson. Because the way it works today is just it's crazy. I uh, I don't know if you're a big Curb Your Enthusiasm person, but I I love Larry David, and he did the episode where he decided after he was done with Seinfeld, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a used car salesman. And just like plays around with it because it's like, I'm a smart guy. I push people around all the time. Why wouldn't I be able to sell a ton of cars? And I, and like, I laugh because I've said this to my wife several times. Like if if things don't work out, I know that our lifestyle that you're accustomed to is probably not going to stay intact, but I want to be a used car salesman because honestly, for all the reasons, and it's not okay, but like for all the reasons you just said, it's like, if you're smart, it shouldn't be hard because you know, all the, like the weak points that these people have the idea that the most expensive purchase has that riddled with weak points on the consumer's end just blows my mind. Like it, it absolutely yeah. blows my mind. Um, I want to learn more about how shift changes things because I look at the, the way that we go in and, and you were just talking about this, obviously the, the car salesman can sort of haggle and, and push back and forth. The way that we get a car is really if, if like, and I don't think most people listening to this are, are going to have ever thought this deeply into car purchasing, but we're going to go down this road. I I just think that 
cars in general, and obviously you know this probably literally better than anyone else, the car, like the, the value of the car when you drive off the lot with a new car drops so ridiculously that the amount of margin that is baked into that, the idea that they don't have better customer care or better like insurance for if I don't like the car, I can take it back or any like there it's insane because there's like yeah. the minute you drive off the lot, the car is worth like half if at best. And the idea that I can't drive a car for 500 miles and determine I don't like it and come back and have a real option like you would anything else you buy is maddening. Yeah. And so we, um, to agree with every part of that, Scott, and the thing that we've, um, like at Shift, we said, hey, we think that there's a technology can create a better way. And so our whole philosophy is how do we use technology to level that playing field, eliminate that information disadvantage, allow people to, when they want to give up their cars, give that car to somebody else. So it's like a peer-to-peer exchange, ultimately, um, and allow people to get access to used cars with the peace of mind that you would have with a new car and the ability to drive it, test it, and return it if you don't want. You think about that, you're like, when I say that, you're like, yeah, obviously, like, that's exactly what I would want. Like, that's, that's a no-brainer, right? What, amazes, what What's amazing is exactly what you said, that that is massively not what this industry is about. And so I think we're going to look back in, you know, five, ten years, and basically in much the same way that we saw ground transportation transform from being a you hail a cab on the street or you call them and you hope they show up and they don't to you push a button on a phone, we're going to see the exact same thing in auto retail. And that is there's going to be a world where you just go online, you find what you want, total transparency, you push a button, and you've got that thing. Or it'll it'll be brought to you and you can test drive it. And I, I, just for clarity's sake, like so shift, I, walk me through the user experience. What, what am I – like I want to get a new car right now. I'm going to buy a car. Walk me through using shift. So there's um, two users. Um, there are what we call sellers. People want to sell their car because that actually is a big problem for most people, being oh, able to sure. sell their car and not get taken advantage of. Um, and then there are buyers, people who want to buy a car. The uh, buyer experience is you go to shift.com, you search around, you look, and there's just listings of cars. You can see all the cars that you would want. You say you push a button that says, see this car, and we will literally schedule a time to bring it out to you on your terms, um, uh, not like bring you into a dealership, have you talk to somebody, but like literally bring it to you and then have you be able to test drive it. Uh, no pushy salesperson. If you want to buy it, we actually have an iPad app that you can use to apply for financing. You can get actually a manufacturer like like new warranty um, so that you basically are getting um, manufacturer like coverage in the period when the manufacturer warranty has expired, which is, by the way, when 90 percent of the repairs actually happen. Of course. And you can do that all right on, uh, totally on your terms. You see all of the lending options that you would get. You see a totally transparent price. There's no negotiation, no haggling. And you can do it all right there, like in your driveway, if you want, at your home or wherever you'd like to meet to do it. It's, it the whole philosophy is uh, connecting you with vehicles, with transparency and on your terms, trying to make it simple and accessible to everyone. It's a miracle, right, how the transmission shits out every time on my car right about when the new model comes out. Interesting. Yes. I, there was, people said the same thing about the iPhone, but we can talk about that later. I was going to say, yeah, or, or anything, my refrigerator, my stove. Every time the holiday season sales come out, that's about when I know that things are going to break. Um, I, I think it's a brilliant idea. I think it's the next evolution of this. It's it's so obviously needed. I don't even think there's a question as far as like the use case here. What is your, like, how did you decide that this was something I want to disrupt? Was it an observation buying or selling a car or was it you personally? Like, what, what is your experience? Yeah, it was. So I, I personally had the experience of um, actually really being nervous about buying a car um, and experiencing particular challenges around selling them. I'll tell both sides of that story. I um, basically would go out and, you know, I, I jokingly say, like, I have a PhD in political economy and I'm afraid to walk into a dealership. So I'm like, whoa, like they have all this information advantage. They're going to take advantage of me. So I like literally was just terrified of buying a car. I would buy two or three cars over the course of decades, and I'd rarely buy a car because I just thought it was such a terrible experience. Um, Then when I did buy one, I took it back to the dealer and said, hey, I'm thinking about buying another one, uh, wondering about trading this thing in. And I'd paid something like $25,000 for that car. It was like a really, you know, big, big deal, like big deal for me to buy. I bought a BMW 3 Series. Uh, And this is when I was working and, you know, feeling really excited, like got this thing. You know, a couple of years later, I bring it back and um, they're like, yeah, we'll give you a trade in for like 13000 
And I'm like, that's strange because you're listing it on your website there for like 19000 And uh, they said, well, yeah, but we can't be certain about your car. And I'm like, well, I know my car. It's a really good car. I can't be car. certain about your car I'm either. I'm pretty sure it's going to work. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, but I'm, I'm, but you have like dozens and dozens of exactly my car listed on your website for like, for way more than what you're offering me. Like, I'm pretty sure it's going to sell for that. And they said, no, we, you know, we, we, we can't be sure. So we're just going to have to give you this much lower price. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you do this? Guarantee me the lower price listed on your site, listed on your, on Let your me lot. Keep the difference. He comes in and buys it. Yeah. We'll split the difference. And they said, we don't do that. And I said, okay, well we will. And that's how we started shift is, is building a thing where a seller could sell their car and a buyer can buy the car with total transparency and we're basically moving the car from one person to another rather than running it through a big infrastructure. And what does that mean? Or a bunch of middlemen. So a lot of cars, like the lease you were talking about, it's as likely as not, Scott, like you take that lease back to a BMW dealer. They may or may not keep that car. In fact, a lot of those cars, what they're going to do is they're going to say, well, yeah, they're going to flip it. This. So they're going to they're going to offer it up to the BMW network, their dealer network. And then many of those dealers might not want it, at which point they'll offer it to a broader network of folks who may not take it. At which point they'll take it to an auction where they'll run two or three times and uh, people may or may not buy it. Now, your car might be a great car and the ground, what they call a grounding dealer might resell it or it might move, the, move its way through all these middlemen, stack up a bunch of costs and get a bunch of what we call negative selection. It's a lot of people who don't want it. And then, you know, a, a big dealer goes and buys it from auction and then pawns it off or pushes it, not pawns it off, that's a bad way to say it, but like then like pushes somebody to buy the thing, like cajoles them into buying a car that's not great. The best cars out in nature are the cars that you were driving, that you want, that you want to keep. You're buying a new one. And so taking that car from somebody who's driving it and getting it directly to somebody else who's driving it is, is our mission. Because, one, those are the best cars. And, two, it cuts out all, a lot of middlemen. So did I, I catch the business model here in, in the explanation where there's sort of a you list it and let's say that you list it at 13, they pay this, and you're going you're gonna to take a certain amount above the proceed? Or are you taking a fee on top of the car right off the bat? Or what's the – how do you guys make money? So it's interesting. The way we got started was exactly that. Um, and then a lot of the a lot of the sellers, the folks that we were talking to, said, "Hey, you know what? What I really want is like my money up front." Yep. So now we've really simplified the product, and a seller can go online, get an instant quote, see what they what, what they can get for their car, and we will actually uh, front them the money. We give them the money right up front, and then we take it and we'll sell it to another another buyer and um, shift float the difference. And then, and and the nice part about you is, unlike the clunky, ridiculous model that currently exists in most all automotive, where, as mentioned before, the savvy used car salesman uh, is being paid money, and all the people who touch the car for those forty-five transactions get a piece of it. In this particular case, it's technology, and so your margins are significantly thinner, or at least, can, other than marketing, presumably a lot thinner, and you get a lot better return. So you don't have to gouge the, the customer. That is that is it. Um, the if you you know when you're selling your car, you're not negotiating with a car salesperson who knows more than you do. You're entering information into an algorithm. It comes back with an answer on what your car will clear for. We actually will send out a driver to come and pick it up from your house to eliminate the hassle. Uh, they'll do a walk around and check it out, and then enter in information if there's a, if around the condition into an uh, iPad app. And then if you if you're like yeah that's the price that I'm cool with at the end the the computer just calculates it you push a button and we uh, basically wire the money to you electronically so you get paid um, electronically for the over you know into your bank account for the car and we take it in so it's like a no hassle single price and no like negotiating and trying to take advantage of you by a car salesman. That is awesome. Sounds like it's it's so perfect when like I, I was just thinking this the other day the 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 beauty of a good business model always lies in its simplicity. Yeah. It's like um, if totally it's agree with that. clunky and weird and you've got to make four turns to get there, it's like this is not – not only is the business model going to be problematic, but like the actual business itself just looks ugly. It just doesn't look – streamlined and you see a businesses that like they've got the supply chain down and they've got their their mechanics behind it and how they're going to sell it and how they're going to market it they should just be like most obvious steps one two three boom and, and that's what usually tends to make obviously successful businesses but the ones that you look at like wow what a great business uh this looks like it's that's definitely that that is a huge advantage of technology is it basically allows you to take a lot of complexity and turn it into simple because instead of having, you know, all the, all the complexity in our business, like the, the thousands of, um, you know, make, model, mileage, year, co like compilations that are going on there, it's all being handled by the software, which creates an experience that is incredibly simple. And that's exactly right, Scott. It's like applying technology. And we think of ourselves as a more of a technology and logistics platform than a retailer. I think most retailers would say, yeah, yeah we're a store. And our website.
website is part of the marketing department and the website drives, you know, traffic to a um, traffic to a store. Whereas in our case, the technology, it drives the logistics, it lays out what happens and people can interact with it. And its whole purpose is to make things simple for folks. That's awesome. So tell me, I want to little, uh, learn a little bit more about you yourself. I mean, um, you know, a lot of the entrepreneurs we talk to, obviously, the one common theme, of course, is that they solve a problem that they experience themselves. That's how they recognize just the ridiculousness that that they're trying to solve. Um, but they tend to have these like weird, I don't know if you want to use the word picadillos, these like weird things about them. And their histories are sort of always complicated, but yet like they like if you were to step back in your life and look back, you'd be like, oh, that makes sense. But there's but in the real time, there's always these weird sort of like and then I did this. You mentioned, you know, like, you know, a PhD, like then I did this. And you're like, what the hell does that have to do with like shift technologies and cars? But then when you step yep. back after you're, you know, 100 years old, hopefully you look back and you're like, oh, it makes perfect sense. You viewed the world through a different lens. And so I'd love to know, like, you know, where did you grow up? What, were, what did your parents do? What was it like to be a little you? Yeah. So um, I, I oftentimes say that I grew up very much with a kind of an outsider's perspective. Um, what do I mean by that? I was born in the Midwest, and when I was very young, my folks, uh, my mom went to go work for the U.S. military uh, down on the Mexican border in El Paso, Texas, as a doctor. And my father went to teach uh, surgery at Texas Tech on the on, on the border. And so I grew up um, not, you know, not the typical white majority, but in a very diverse, um, very Hispanic community. And, not, you know, I had to learn Spanish uh, growing up and always felt like I was kind of observing, like I'm, you know, quote, unquote, not from there, but observing and learning. Um, from there, you know, said, Hey, I grew up, was born in the Midwest, grew up in the Southwest, thought it'd be cool to have a different experience, went to school out on the East coast, and then moved to the United Kingdom. I uh, went and did a PhD on of all things, Russian foreign policy, specifically technology transfer policy. So if this thing doesn't work out, you're in good shape. And it's totally random. You're like, of course, <laughs> naturally that's what you do. Um, so yeah, I grew up speaking Spanish and, um, some, a couple of my good friends in high school and then in, um, yeah, and my co-founder, actually, of, of uh, both companies, is, or was a native Russian speaker. He's like, hey, you should try out Russian. I jokingly say I should have learned Python, a machine <laughs> language, instead of studying more human languages. But I you know, went ahead and studied another human language because you know, this, was, this was many years ago. Um, and so the idea was wanting to learn and understand, hey, how is someone else thinking about a thing? Why are they making the decisions they're making? Why, why, why is what's happening happening? And I believe that that's actually pretty core toward the entrepreneurial journey and the um, product development mindset of always being able to say, okay, you know, I know my needs and that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a point of view. Uh, I also want to understand the needs of others. And you, you build companies around, in particular, customers and user needs, saying, what is their need? What, what's going on for them? What's the challenge? And how could this world be different that would make their lives better? Um, and so my journey was one of just constantly trying to learn and constantly trying to figure out, like, what is it that is – uh, challenging for folks, and how can we make it better? How can we transform that thing? And so I try to think of myself as having grown up very much with that outsider mindset of that learning thing of like, hey, I, don't, I literally don't even speak the language of, uh, that's predominant in the place that I live. Let me learn the language. Let me understand this culture. Let me understand why people are doing what they're doing. And then um, my second piece was, uh, given that I've, you know, I've been a lot of different places and gotten to see a lot of things, I like to connect dots and say, hey, this is what's happening over here. That thing could happen over here. That's the definition of innovation, different than invention, but the definition of innovation is taking um, concepts that might exist elsewhere and applying them um, in a different zone or a different area. And so I've always been a big fan of, of innovating. Um, I've done that in a few different places and saying, look, this dynamic is happening here. You know, the, um, uh, in, in 2007, my co-founder, George, and I you know, had this vision that we thought, hey, mobile computing is going to become a big thing. And um, we said, in particular, we thought it was going to be a huge thing for ground transportation. You mentioned transportation earlier, Scott. And so we decided to go out and create this crazy idea of uh, building an, a Java app for a BlackBerry such that you could push a button on that BlackBerry. I don't know if you remember Blackberries, but it was the first sort of real. I was uh, the first on right Crackberry, there. man. You were using that thing. Oh, so yeah. Like, hey, what if there was a mobile app where you could push a button on that thing and a taxi would come pick you up and then you could pay for it with your credit card electronically? And we built that in 2007. This is, you know, a full couple of years before Uber um, came together. And then we, you know, we had, it, had it on like Windows Mobile, and then eventually the iPhone came out, and we built it. And it was a company called Taxi Magic. And I jokingly say it was like Netscape of the Uber space. We, we invented the concept of mobile, mobile ground travel. Um, and the idea was saying, look, there's, there's an opportunity here. Like people are using their, these mobile devices to control like their calendar and their email and their communications. 
why shouldn't they be able to control your, you know, your physical environment and be able to get you, in this case, um, a, a, a taxi um, or a, a cab? And so we built that thing out. And originally, it's funny because, like, when you get started, everybody looks at you and they're just like, you're crazy. Like, what are you talking about? That's not possible. And we're like, no, no, no. Like, the world is going to be very different in, like, five years. Everybody's going to be doing this thing. And then the same thing with, with you know, cars. People come to me and they say, wow, no one will ever buy a car online. You're crazy. And I'm like, in, in five to ten years, you're going to look back and be like, wow, why would you ever show up at a dealership to look for a car? Like, that's insane. Um, and so even though that is the 99% use case today, just as hailing a cab or calling a taxi um, with a phone was the 90, 99% use case in 2007, you know, uh, within, within five to ten years, the entire thing is transformed. And so that's the thing that I enjoy is saying, hey, what's the user need and how might we make this thing just like, you know, tremendously different but better um, in, in, based on what, what those users are. And that, that's been kind of my journey is going from thing to thing and place to place and kind of learning as an outsider of what, what is that story. So didn't grow up a car, used car salesman, never wanted to be a used car salesman, but do want to transform this industry to make it better for the people who want to be able to use it. Just want to get rid of used car salesmen. And I don't mean that in like getting rid of jobs. It's just that's one of those jobs. So like, yeah, I mean, you see Curb, I assume you're referring to Curb now is what it's known as. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. So um, so you still see it. I mean, you go into cabs yeah. now and there's a Curb, the the teal blue Curb sticker is, is in nearly every cab in Chicago. That's right. Uh, Chicago, New York, uh, Las Vegas, there are a bunch of cities where uh, it's still part of the core taxi infrastructure uh, that, that, that is at work in today. Um, so, you know, not Uber, but the point is that there's a vision there. You know, you, you invent an industry, you can, env- you can envision a, a thing that can be very different than the world today. And that's, it, it, that's kind of my journey. And we'll get yeah, to and it's a cool journey. I mean, it may not be uh, Uber, but the reality is uh, if there was a head table, you're going to be sitting at it next to Uber because that, that was sort of the predecessor. Um, it's funny you mentioned in the you know in your conversation here the the dialogue between innovation and invention, and I I spent my first uh, I guess my first career if you will before I got into technology and all this stuff was was helping large companies in innovation building products particularly using like media which when we it's so weird to me that even today when I say media people are like oh podcast your podcast I'm like just because I have a podcast does not mean that that is like all media is to me like to me. What you're creating, what you created in Taxi Magic Curb, there's an, an element of media there. There's there's using mm. the tools and things that we we actually communicate on, like in the end. Yeah. And so we used to use like I would go into these large companies, and and some of them were actually like the textbook definition of a media company, the Hearst and sometimes Tribune things, um, but a lot of them were totally unrelated to to media. And I would work on ways that they could use communication tools, whether that's hardware or software, to innovate. And to streamline processes and to provide a better user experience and or customer experience so that they could, in the end, uh, drive more revenue. That was the, the, you know, the end game. And when you talk about the innovation piece, it's so interesting to me because I would go into these gigantic companies and, and I get it. They're paying for you to come in. And so the expectation is you're going to give them some mind blowing like blue sky. You're going to create this brand new thing that's like no one's ever seen before. And the reality is my obsession and their obsession should be, and clearly yours is, is in the incremental. It's in the reapplication. It's in the revitalization. It's using, you know, tried and true processes and things that people historically have had to do so you don't have to change the way they behave, but give them a new way to function with it. And that new way to function gives you a completely new canvas to build a business model on, to build revenue streams and to build user experiences and stories that then sort of like in a flywheel effect sort of self-perpetuates the business. And it's it's amazing now having conversations with you and others like you, where that was in your brain when you were trying to study Russian, like the concept of looking at something and being like, how could I make this better? And what could once I made it better, what other opportunities would arise as a result? And I think that's the part that a lot of you know even big time CEOs, but a lot of founders even of like you would think would be the most innovative people, they they get stuck on that got to create the biggest, newest, shiniest object and, and completely lose sight that, you know, 70 plus percent of all of our daily behavior is more or less trying to ac- accomplish the same goal as it was hundreds of years ago. Eating, yeah. getting around, protecting our family, having, a, you know, all shelter. It's all the same, but we like don't quite go after it you know, and sometimes in a lot of the smartest ways. I totally agree with you on that, Scott. I've, I've long said... Um... If you think about it, people say, hey, Facebook invented social networking. 
And I'm like, no, they didn't invent social networking. They created a novel technical solution to solve the very the, 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 that, that problem or that issue. People have been engaging in social networking since they sat around a fire in a cave. It's yep. just a different way of doing and solving that same need. Like you said, most, most user and people's needs are pretty, are pretty stable. Like the, the, the core need has been there for centuries. The question is, how do we as entrepreneurs address that better and differently? Um, I love your media example. And the, the, the Russian example is uh, learning a new language isn't about saying the same thing with different words. It's about learning a new framework or mindset um, with which to think, a new, dare I say, paradigm yeah. and a way of viewing the world. And when you get your mind into a place where you can start understanding these different paradigms, you can transform from one to another. So the media example, um, a lot of newspaper media is a great example. Oh, yes. There's an entire organization built around figuring out what should the front page above the fold headline be. And you see you have an entire editorial team and huge talent and years of people developing and learning how to surface the right thing to be that headline. And then you introduce the concept of an iPad app or a digital format where you're like, you don't have to pick just one. In fact, you can, based on each individual human being, target a different headline based on what they're going to choose to care about. That's a totally different paradigm. And you look at like a traditional media company and they're, you know, it's just minds start to explode being like, whoa, like I, I, that doesn't make any sense. Like where's editorial judgment? And you're like, well, it's just a whole new technical solution to solve the same need. The need is someone wants to see the headline that they care about. And you've built an apparatus that's designed to do that with one static page on a physical piece of paper. But when you change the technology, you can address the need very differently. And that paradigm shift, that understanding of a completely different mindset, a completely different set of capabilities, albeit to solve the same need, is something that large companies in particular really struggle to go through. Oh, my God, yes. I don't even need to get into the stories of working with uh, – well, I, I'm at WGEN's not owned by Tribune anymore, so I can say it. Working with Tribune and others was just like – I'm scratching my head. Like, you're – we're here for two different reasons. You're here – I thought I was here, and you're here to solve this problem. In reality, you're here to solve this problem so long as it does not disrupt anything that you currently are comfortable with. Like if you make your money this way and your people are employed and you want to protect your job and everything, you want to solve this problem so long as it doesn't adjust that. Well, the problem here is the world has shifted and now it's consumer led, not, you know, rich white dude in a suit led. And that totally. fundamentally is your problem. And it's like, you know, it's it's an interesting you talk about Facebook. It's, so, it's such a good point because Facebook, like you said, didn't reinvent anything or, or, or invent anything as much as it did like cut out the annoyance of having to interact with certain individuals around the water cooler. Like Facebook just got, gave me the mute button essentially. And then to monetize, they didn't even create anything new. They just did exactly what everybody else is doing, which is just ads. The only thing that's unique now is, is the ability for them to actually harness data and use that for good or for evil. And and that's a whole nother, you know, layer on top of this and in your business too, is like getting consumer behaviors and in some cases, it might be to sell the data, assuming you're doing it in the right way. It might be to sell insights based on the data. In your case, you actually are going to learn so much about the behavior of the buyer and the seller that it should be able to, to sharpen your own algorithms, your own technology source, so that you can make this even more streamlined, which is incredibly enriching for the user. It's funny you mentioned there's, um, I think of it, there's data businesses and then there's like, call it material businesses. Um, for some reason, I personally have always gravitated toward the do something material for a user. Yep. Uh, and that is like, you know, push a button, get a taxi, like online to offline, real world, make a difference. And I'm not against the, you know, the, the photo sharing apps and the social media apps and uh, a lot of it. I do think it comes with some problematic challenges around who owns data and the use of data because you're essentially trying to say, hey, I'll give you this free thing in exchange for your data that I'm going to sell to somebody else. And maybe you'll like that. And maybe you won't. Um, whereas like I personally have always really loved the call it simplicity of, Hey, you're a user, you want a thing, you're looking for a car or you're a user and you want to sell your car. Like we're going to use technology to make that. We're going to innovate and create something new, different, create a novel technical solution for how you can do that. And the deal is really simple. Like we're going to help you get your car or help you sell your car. And the way we make money is not buying your data or selling your data, doing stuff behind the scenes. Uh, we're straight up just going to say, you know, we're going to pay X or for this car. We're going to pay you this and this person's going to pay a bit more and we're going to capture a little bit of a spread on that marketplace and be transparent about it uh, and totally straightforward. So it's like a clear business model and there's a material impact and you're doing something that kind of 
it directly matters in people's lives that they're like, oh, I get that. Like, I have a car and I want to get rid of it, or I need a car, or I need to push a button and a taxi is going to come pick me up, or you know. And I, I spent some time in financial services doing um, some fintech like stuff. It's like, hey, I need a bank account and I want to be able to pay for stuff, you know, like that kind of deal. A uh, very concrete, very, very um, kind of clear business model, and not the let me, you know, sort of bait and switch a little bit around, get your data and not tell you about it, but sort of tell you about it and sell it to somebody or you name it. Oh, that, 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 that's, a, that's, a, that's a tricky space. Well, it is. And it, the next big wave of, of data and like the use case, and, and I, I've said this actually before in a, in a panel I was on recently where <clears throat> the next, like the next big thing in data is how they monetize it. In the past, the before was that they paid us. Like, I don't mean us as a consumer, but like companies paid us as the media company for the data that we farmed. The new yep. big hot thing is we, the media company, pay you, the user, for your data a little bit, but then we sell it off to the guy who was paying us before, which is not dissimilar from the the used car model, to be totally honest. Uh, we're going to give you pennies on the dollar for what you think you're not worth or you think you are worth, and I'm going to sell all the insights to some big conglomerate for a ton of money, which you'll never see. And that, like, yeah. you know, I, I guess if you wanted to be, you want to look at it like an innovator, which you are, I mean, you can see the frailties in that right now. Like, yeah, it'll probably catch and take off for a couple of years, but that has all of the exact same huge errors and, and, and disruptable components just as all of the businesses that you've already worked in and disrupted, which is, I think, really cool to see the kind of the full circle of this. Is like as much as you get bigger and grow and change, the world changes, it all is still the same. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that that'll actually that'll, that'll move the conversation along a little bit in the form of, hey, I'm paying you a little bit for your data. As soon as somebody does that, it's going to raise the right conversation, which is, by the way, your data is valuable, and you're, what you're getting is in exchange for that. And maybe it makes sense for you to not let your data just flow freely, but pay for a technology that um, will protect your data. <laughs> and oh, so for suddenly sure. That, it's no longer a quote-unquote like a bait and switch or a, a hidden cost that you don't really know or see. Uh, there's transparency there. It creates real transparency, and, and that's valuable and important. There should be that transparency. I mean, if I had the money, and this isn't my sweet spot in business, but if I had the money, I would absolutely be in a software business where I layer on top of, for example, Gmail or Google, where I say basically, you use my software to harness and farm the data that they were going to farm for you by saving all of your data and all your emails and all your photos. I'm going to catch it and assess a value, and then those other companies can bid to have it. That is yeah. like if you want to start a business, I'm in that one all day long. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's um, I don't I don't mean to malign ad tech at all, but um, somebody no, no do quote, please they said, do. <laughs> they, they just stepped back and they said, look, you know what? Um, we're living in an era where the greatest minds of our generation are being applied to figure out how to serve up better ads. Is that in fact the best use of the the very best talent? that our community and our society has to offer. And I think we should all reflect on that a little bit. It's lucrative, but I'm not sure that that's actually, you know, necessarily the best way for us to advance ourselves as a, as a species or as a civilization, if that makes sense. Not to go down. No, it's a good one, but no, but that's a really poignant thing though, because not to go down that rabbit hole, but the truth is like, I I think you can go back in history. Well, you know, time will tell, but look at our situation right now in this country and I think it's hard not to point and say that that is part of the problem, that the not only that the biggest brains have been paying attention to the wrong stuff, but that in a sense, I don't want to make it seem guilty like they did it for evil because that wasn't the intention, I don't think. But when you spend all of your smartest individual's time trying to figure out how to sway people into what is ultimately a purchase or a vote or a buy or whatever it is, that is going to sour the water. It's going to make people not behave the way that they naturally would. And ultimately, I think we're seeing that. I think we're seeing their their behaviors both in consumption and bullying and and just, you know, spite and just all this stuff. And I think it's all, I do think there's a direct correlation to the fact that like if you had the most brilliant people basically working in marketing, not working in solving global problems, people's intentions and their the altruism goes out the window people's intentions and their desires are to pursue stuff that's kind of meaningless and and so i i actually really quite agree with you and would like to reflect on that probably uh even more but um you know to that point wrapping things up a little bit where what would you say would be the thing that is the place where the greatest minds should be spending most of their time especially considering how you grew up with your parents you know teaching medical and and, and helping on the border with with those in need 
where where do you think this the the brightest minds in tech should spend their time? So um, I uh, I tend to think, and this is this is a you know I'll give a short answer and then a, then a broader one. They should spend time applying technology to level the playing field and empower people, enable people to do things they couldn't have done before, uh, or do it for them. Uh, I usually say you know good technology lets you do stuff, great tech does it for you. Um, I, I think that there are, in terms of verticals, you know, there are areas like education that I think is a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. It's really hard to get a business to go around there. But I think that we're going to see transformation in the way that um, people attain, understand, develop knowledge and interact over time um, with, um, with that. I, I believe transportation is an important space. So obviously I'm, I'm in that zone and I've spent most of my uh, technology time in sort of transportation and finance. Um, so those are those are things that I think can be transformed by by technology, but I also think there are areas that are outside my zone, uh, like healthcare and the environment, that are really really critical, um, that um, are going to be big, big big opportunities. I spent about 18 months working at the U.S. Department of Energy, running a large deployment program, to try to really transform the landscape when it comes to uh, clean tech, so uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy uh, technology and infrastructure in the United States was focused domestically only. And I, I think there still is a tremendous, it's a hard, it's a hard capital intensive world there, but I think there's a tremendous amount that we need to do on that front uh, to ensure environmental sustainability. Uh, and that, that sounds like a, a, you know, left wing kind of crazy hippie thing. And it's not like the, 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 the change in our environment and our climate is having material impacts on our lives and our sustainability. And that's a, that's a security issue. And so I'd like to, you know, see, see more folks solving uh, problems like education um, transparency and enablement, things like transportation, allowing people to level playing fields, and then uh, thinking about our broader, the environment we live in. I think that is very well said. I could not agree with you anymore. And I think that the other part about this that a lot of smart folks like Jeff Bezos and another guy in ad tech uh, and, and Elon Musk have figured out that like, if it's if you're solving a great need, like something that, like you mentioned, education to me is the most obvious. So much change is going to happen and it has to happen there will be plenty of opportunity and business models there. Like you don't have to worry about like, oh, it's not, you know, the business is tough there right now. Yeah, it was tough in the past, but kind of going to the beginning of our conversation, like if you create something very interesting and a new evolution of it, that's a whole new layer to build new revenue models on that you've never even seen before. Um, and so I, I could not agree with you anymore. Toby, this has been um, a ton of fun to talk to you, learn about your career, your journey, and obviously shift. I will be uh, giving you a peruse on shift to have to, look over and figure out how am I going to get the next car? Uh, where do people go to actually try out shift? Yeah. Just go to shift.com. S H I F T. Like you, like you're shifting a car.com shift.com is the place to go check it out. Uh, that's the, you can do both sides of that thing, whether you're searching for a car or you want to hand one off. And if we're not in your area, cause we do have to have, we, we, you know, we create jobs and put, um, you know, physical operations on the ground. If we're not there, go on, go online and request it and let us know that you want us to get there. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the story we have. So that's shift.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Toby. Likewise, Scott.